Welcome, everybody. Here we are for the podcast for this week. Hey, fellas, how are y'all? Great. Doing everybody fantastic. Good? Glad to hear it. Yep. Glad to hear it. Had a good week? Yes. So far? We're recording on Tuesday today, which is unusual. Usually Tuesday it's afternoon. Monday morning. Tuesday afternoon. We're recovering mm-hmm. from Memorial Day. You want to tell them why we're going afternoon? I'll be happy to, because I was out working doing something else for the church. <laughs> I was buying orchids today for the church at Sam's. That's why. That's a teaser. I have been to something. Sam's twice. They don't know what the orchids are for. <laughs> nope, but they're coming their way if they show <laughs> maybe. up. Maybe. 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 Just maybe. 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 I bought every orchid Sam's had twice this week, and I'm telling you, if you want to get some stairs, you buy all the orchids at Sam's and walk out with them. I so if you've them. gone to Sam's looking for orchids, then I got them. Uh, I know got them. Stolen why them you're all. upset? <laughs> Upward got them all, but they will be back. They restock really fast. They did this week anyway. Oh, I but thought that's you were going to be taking them back. <laughs> nope, nope. I'm keeping them. But that's where I was. We'll just return them when we're finished. Yeah, you can't do that. No, no, no. Nope. Uh, we're giving them away when we're finished. Hey, okay. Well, all right. Well, throw them out. Throw so everything maybe out you'll there. get one if you're watching out 16, there. You get an orchid. You get and an you orchid. get an orchid. We have you get an orchid. 73 orchids to give away. So we'll see how that works. That's mm-hmm. how many orchids I've bought this week. Please do not message the podcast asking if you can be one of the no. ones to have an orchid. Please do not. <laughs> Invite only. <laughs> Uh, we kicked off a brand new series this past weekend called Born Again. We did. Yeah. Born Again. Yeah. It's good. It was good. I had a good day. Enjoyed it. Good couple days. Good, good weekend. Co- <laughs> Whatever. Thursday and Thursday, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Had a good time. Yep. I enjoyed that message. I love Nicodemus. He's such a powerful character in the scriptures. You know, he's a powerful man. And his story of his coming to faith in Christ mm-hmm. and his devotion to Christ is just just amazing. Yeah. We tend to think of the Pharisees as these bad guys, and they really were in a lot of senses. They're very religious, very uh, strict, very uh, unforgiving, and uh, Jesus had so many harsh words for for them. And to think there was this one out of the bunch that came actually seeking Jesus and found him. Yeah. That's a powerful story. Yeah, and he has this. So he has this amazing encounter, amazing conversation with Jesus, which we're going to be looking at over the uh, over the next several weeks. And we are. Um, and so you kind of laid some laid some really interesting uh, you know groundwork based off of those first two verses there in uh, John yeah. chapter three, and mm-hmm. kind of getting some things started there. Um, one of the things that you that you laid out for us is you know kind of that he came to Jesus privately. He didn't. He did. um, you know, he didn't kind of. And it, I don't know. He de- there's not a whole lot as the reason why. I think you threw a couple of reasons out there as to why he may have come to Jesus uh, privately and not out in public and that kind of thing. But uh, laying out there the idea that we can come to Jesus privately as well. Yeah, we sure can. It's funny. I'm thinking about this. Jesus made a little play on that later in the conversation, and we're going to come to it. But uh, he said, uh, the light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their ease, deeds were evil. Mm-hmm. He said everybody practicing evil hates the light and doesn't come to the light lest yeah. his deeds be exposed. So it's funny that Jesus had a little play between light and darkness later on in the conversation when Nicodemus came to see him in yep. the dark. I find that funny. <laughs> but we did say uh, that it's okay to come to Jesus privately. It really is. I, I came to Christ alone mm-hmm. in my bedroom. Of course, I'd had a lot of people telling me, and all my life I've been in church, most of it anyway, but the moment I made that decision to follow Jesus, it was just me and him. And uh, the glory of it is that Jesus will talk to you privately. Yeah. He will, as he did Nicodemus. He didn't run him away. He gave him a personal audience. And the point I wanted to bring across was that every person has that privilege of having a personal conversation with Jesus. Whenever they open their heart and want to talk to him, he listens right. and he'll talk back. You made a you made the uh, you know talking about the statement there about how we come about how we come to Jesus and even those moments of yeah you, you told the story about how you know you accepted Christ and and, and said yes to a relationship with him. Uh, when we when we extend invitations from the platform for people to receive Christ, oftentimes we will tell people to to bow their head and close their eyes, and you know we we say things like you know nobody's going to call you out or anything. We really do try to drive home that this is a personal choice, it's a personal decision that you're that you're making here uh, in front of Jesus. But I've been in other settings too where uh, they've had you know that was saying every every head up, every eye open, everybody everybody kind of looking around. Um, and I've even heard some statements, and I probably have made something 
similar before as well is something to the effect of that if you're not if you're not willing to stand to hear people that love you and care about you then you're not and you're probably not going to stand outside the walls or anything like that um I, I don't know that we're pushing back on some of those statements or anything like that but really just trying to drive home that this is a uh this is a decision that you are making between you and you and jesus in this moment in time right here that it's uh we're not really concerned about anybody else we'll talk about that in a minute but right now this is something that god's doing in your heart I do push back on those statements. Okay, maybe There's you do. <laughs> people have come to me before at Upward and said, why do you tell people you're not embarrassing them and you close your eyes? Let's just look up because if you're going to follow Jesus, you do it publicly. Yeah. That does happen. Yeah. Yes, We talk about sure. that in a minute. <laughs> we'll get there, second point. Yeah. But your initial decision to make it to, to receive Christ, that's between you and God, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, if I'm a guest and I come to a church for the very first time and I'm making a lifetime decision, I may not want to just say that first day, uh, yeah, here I am. Because right. I don't want 15 people swarming me after church and <laughs> I don't know anybody there. Right. We choose to give a person a moment of privacy to make that decision before God. And then if they wish to make that public by raising their hand where I and a few others can see that, yeah. you know. And uh, But... Yeah, you come to Christ privately. Yeah. It doesn't stay private. Right. And there's that moment, if you want to jump over into the next one, where we said Nicodemus, after seeking Jesus privately, he stood up for Jesus. He spoke up for him publicly. Right. And we did celebrate that moment uh, with uh, 12 people this weekend when they were baptized. We see the moment you come to Christ can be between you and Jesus, but there comes a moment when he says it's time to be baptized, mm -hmm. and that is your public profession of having made the decision to follow Christ. And that's incredibly vital. So I get it when people say it's got to be public because a relationship with Christ will become public yeah. and should. I get that. But I do push back against the first time they make a decision for Christ, yeah. it's got to sure. be in front of the whole world. I like to think about it like if you are if you made another really important decision in your life, like if you wanted to give up an addiction like drinking or something, the your first step in that is not always going to be, I'm going to go stand in front of a group of my friends and say, everybody, I'm an alcoholic and I'm quitting today. Like, uh, I'm just going to stop. That uh, Most of the time, decisions like that can happen in your house, just thinking, I need to stop this or I, I, whatever it is, not just that. Uh, and I, I think it's the same with Christianity. The thing about Christianity that separates it from a lot of other world religions. It's a very personal religion. It's very uh, almost intimate. You're, you're closer to, to God than a lot of the other belief systems out there. So I love the idea of things happen happening privately within Christianity, yep. which we believe is the true faith. Um, we have that personal one-on-one -on -one interaction with God, and it doesn't always have to be in the corporate setting that we're talking with him and making big decisions with him. It's not our job to put tons of rules on everybody about yeah, what exactly right. has to happen for them to get yeah. saved. If you want to, if you want to really debate that, go to the thief on the cross. <laughs> the guy yeah. couldn't do a ton of things that we say you've got to do. Yeah, right. You know great. what I mean? Many times, a lot of the rules in church about what you must do to be saved. This guy didn't have a chance. Yeah. But pretty good authority that Jesus Himself <laughs> said, "Today you'll be yeah. with me in Wait paradise." Wait a minute. <laughs> I think that's a pretty solid word right there. Yeah. But the time came in Nicodemus' life. We jumped forward to John chapter 7 when uh, Jesus is, uh, they're trying to put him on trial early. You know, he's in Jerusalem at the Feast of Shelters and he proclaims all this stuff about himself. And the Pharisees try to arrest him, can't. The guards won't bring him because of his teaching. Yep. And uh, so Nicodemus is there and they're like, who here believes in Jesus? Is there anybody in the room that believes in Jesus? <laughs> One smart Alec Pharisee is like, nobody even in here believes in him. That was Nicodemus' chance to stand up. Yeah. And I think that's so important that we stand up publicly for Jesus when we're truly his followers. That moment comes when we're given an opportunity to stand publicly, and that's so important that we do that. Yeah, you made the uh, you made the comment that it was you know about standing up, speaking up, uh, even even driving home the idea that when uh, when Nicodemus spoke up, the meeting broke up, and you really talked oh, about it's wonderful to, how that rhymed. I, I, I don't know how you did that. I mean, I just did on. not. That was not in the notes. I just saw I it up there. Experience. I saw it up there, experience. and I said he spoke it, spoke up, and the meeting broke up. Yeah, the whole idea behind that that I just saw on the fly, you know, that I didn't really plan. 
that's going to make a good sermon. I really think if I could take a second run at some of these, it could be really good. <laughs> but uh, the the idea is that when you speak up, you actually do change atmospheres in mm-hmm. the room. You really do. And that's that's all good, and it should be. I, I said this, the, the earth is the Lord's. It belongs to mm-hmm. Jesus. He created all this that is. So it's his. We are his people here. He's given us authority here not to just stand back or sit back and be quiet when we need to speak up. Right. Now, there's enough people speaking up that there who are, you know, we talked about the church police or the religious jerks Ooh. that the Pharisees, yeah, that's they have sirens and badges <laughs> and everything. Uh, the, the, we talk about the church police as religious people who are always wanting to just condemn and yep. shame and, and police everybody's lives. Uh, we, we're called to, to bring to this earth a spiritual authority. And when we speak up, we do that, and we do change atmospheres mm-hmm. in rooms when we speak up. You don't have to be, as a Christian, a victim of the atmosphere of the room. You can actually walk into it and affect that. So essentially Nicodemus spoke up, and it broke up the whole meeting. Yep. He just said they were tempting to try him, and Nicodemus said, hey, you're trying to convict a man before you've even talked to him. And so they start fighting, and the meeting breaks right up. Yeah, I like to think of it as steps, and that's how you, I feel like you kind of laid it out with – we talk about like in life and in our faith, the concept of like what you do in private is revealed in public. Sure. There's scripture about that. But even just like in life, like uh, I'm, I've heard you give an example of like Olympic athletes, like they're being honored in public when they win a gold medal because of all the work they've done in private. Yeah. And it's same here. It's like when we can, when we talk and meet with Jesus in private, that works itself out in public when we get chances to speak up. So, it really does. But I do like to think of it as steps of like, there might be people trying to speak up maybe too soon <laughs> before they've had a lot of private uh, conversation with Jesus. But so, yeah. well, it might be important to note that yeah. Nicodemus did have some standing in the room as well. He yeah. wasn't just a guy walking in somewhere he didn't belong. He was in his totally. place of authority when yep. he did that. Yep. You know, uh, I can't very go into a, a place that that I'm not a part of and never been and start telling them what to do and everything. Yep. I can have a spiritual authority in the place, but Nicodemus was in his spot. If, if you could put this in modern terms, Nicodemus was at his job. Yep. And within mm-hmm. his job, within the scope of authority he had, he spoke up for Christ. Yep. And that may translate to someone on their job just helping if maybe they serve on a board somewhere and they can help steer their company towards doing the right and the honest thing Mm -hmm. if they're doing something that may be a little shady you know there are people i know all the time that deal with that at work something a little shady is going on and they have an opportunity to say you know let's do the right thing let's be honest and transparent around this and do the right thing god bless us for it so that's an opportunity we all have when we see yeah. some injustice going on you know somebody's just being treated poorly or treated unfairly let's speak up and help that person you know let's let's rally to the cause of those who are hurting you know let's be a voice in our community for for truth and righteousness and compassion and then you kind of laid out for us there is kind of looking at the end of Jesus's life as he was you know crucified that you know it kind of brought out the uh, the scenario there where uh, Nicodemus had the opportunity to sacrifice personally yeah. uh, for this as well, and kind of man, you—I'll uh, I, be honest with you—I'd never heard or never even put the, put together the dots there about uh, about how much uh, Nicodemus would have spent uh, on Jesus's uh, body at, at that it's point, preparing him for death. Yeah, you know, it says some translations say a hundred pounds. NLT will use Sunday says seventy-five pounds. It's all in conversions and sure. things. It's either one. It's incredibly extravagant. I, I uh, searched a lot and Googled a lot about uh, what that that amount of spices would cost. So right. the Jews were very careful to wrap bodies up carefully and, and, and in a sense embalm them with spices, not in the same way we would, but, but cover them with spices, you know. Mm-hmm. Typically they used about a pound per body. Nicodemus put 75 pounds on Jesus, which translates to about $200,000 in modern money, which is crazy <laughs> to think. <laughs> uh yeah, I crazy. Kind, of, kind of hard to wrap my head around, even crazy. now, <laughs> even now that that idea. But the idea that hey, Nicodemus stepped in here and uh, was a part of uh, part of preparing Jesus's death for for burial uh, in that uh, as well. And uh, you made the statement there um, that I think you even said something to the effect of you know, kind of jokingly uh, that talk about overkill. But then, but then, kind of circling back around, like nothing poured out on Jesus is, is ever wasted. Um, 
Never. Never. T- talking about, you know, what would you say? He came in, he was born into the world in a manger, but he was buried he was, in, with royalty. He uh, was born as a pauper, and, yeah. he, and he was buried as a king. Yeah, there you go. He was, completely. And that's just amazing to me to see. Yeah. Um, it's this progression in Nicodemus' life that he sought Jesus privately, he spoke up for him publicly, and then he sacrificed personally, we said, just to make the alliteration there work. But he poured out his worship on Jesus. This had to be a huge chunk of his money. Sure. I mean, it had to be a huge chunk of his life. And uh, he put that on Jesus. And and the thing about Jesus is he only used it for three days. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> right. not like it's even going to last longer. Yeah. Three days he's in there. But it was an honor. Nothing you pour out on Jesus is wasted. Moves me as well that a Pharisee helped take Jesus down off the cross, a Pharisee that he'd won over. Mm-hmm. And it was a Pharisee who provided. Uh, people debate a bit about Joseph Ar- Arimathea, his profession, but many believe he was also a religious leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, think about the fact two religious men are the ones putting him in the right. tomb. Because they would have had to, they would have needed to be people of some authority to actually get his body. The disciples. Likely Peter and John, they were Peter was gone anyway. John was there, but uh, fishermen probably, <laughs> I'm sure they weren't able to appeal to Pilate for the right. body. It needed to be somebody of some social standing and some authority, and they the, were the ones to take his body down and bury him like a king. I mean, uh, the translation for us, I think, is just that our lives are meant to be poured out in worship to Jesus. Yeah, I want to live the rest of my life just pouring it out, saying, Jesus, today is an act of worship to you. What I do, every meeting I have, every person I see, I worship you by doing what I do. It's good. Mm, it's really good. Well, guys, it's good. Love y'all. Appreciate you. you. Yep. Audience, we love you guys and are so glad to have y'all with us. We will see you again next time. You be blessed. <laughs>